Hello and welcome to Just Do It, a Dewey Brothers podcast, season six, episode eleven. Hello, Eric. What's going What's going on this week? How are things in in Potsdam? Unseasonally warm. Uh, last night into today, uh, and then also today it got very very cold. Uh, we have a bipolar weather front moving in. Um, like that one famous Katy Perry song. You're hot and you're cold, you're up and you're down, or other sort of opposites. Oh, of course, of course, yeah. We are, it's just been hot here, down in the the Bostonian region. We have warm weather with extra warm weather. It's it's muggy and rainy and 50 to 60 degrees. It's not right, Eric. It's not, this isn't February. Mayhaps I have moved significantly closer to the ocean and more south than I anticipated moving. That happens to the best of us. Yeah, it's, it's it's tragic. Unfortunately, the only lyrics down here for songs we have are... can't think of any off the top of my head. Uh, I believe there's only one song when you're in the greater Boston area, and that's I'm shipping somewhere near Boston. That is that is correct. Gotta be shipping somewhere near Boston. Um, all the time, most goods, including warm weather. Anything... Uh... Anything non-weather related going on with you? Everything revolves around the weather down here, Eric. It's it's weather this, weather that, weather the storm, you know. That's just mm. batting down the hatches. Sometimes you're batting it up the hatches, sometimes you're batting them down. That's that's, that's all I got down here. Yeah. Cuz uh I'm personally extremely busy. I'm uh I get to paint rocks and I get to put them in the sandbox and I get to run water over them. And then I, uh, I also have to floss my teeth. Gotta, gotta floss the face rocks, Eric. That's what, that's what the dentist always says. Mm-hmm. Also, so. do you, when you paint the rocks and put them in the water, do you give them little names? Uh, no, no, no. They're too small. They're too small. Okay. If you need some painted rocks, I know a certain park at which you can get some. Oh, do they have names at that park? Uh, all summer long. Uh, maybe you're going to steal them from kids, but usually they are abandoned. Oh. Stealing rocks from kids is like taking candy from an old man. It's easy. Once you once you take away their walker, they don't move very fast. That's true. Taking those Werther's Originals? They're liable to leave them all over the place and forget about exactly. them. Exactly. like candy. It's like taking Werther's Originals from the senior folks. Oh, I mean, talk about pretty easy. As long as you're willing to endure a long explanation about how it was different back in the day. Yeah, no, that sounds about right. Mm-hmm. And how these young y- yipper snappers are always running to and fro. Oh, but uh, yeah, Alex. In our lab, we have a uh, strict no name policy oh, uh, okay. because you don't want to you don't want to build up a uh, emotional connection with these rocks. Right, right. That's that's fair. You don't want to do that. That then you might try and save them from being ground down. Um, and that wouldn't be okay. Yeah. Also, like we we lose them into the into the greater pool all the time. And uh, Alex, I, I'm gonna let you in on a little insider thing. They're extremely replaceable. <laughs> oh wow. We uh. Hey, you might want to keep that quiet in case other rocks are listening, Eric. Oh, Alex, we have lured so many rocks into our uh, traps, our rock traps that uh, they we just have we have too many rocks to know what to do with. Mm-hmm. And um, I'm pretty sure at the rate we're going, we we're set. We're set for life on pebbles, gravels, uh, boulders, stones, stones. Not all right. Not not curling stones though. We don't. We need to. I think yeah. I might need to go raid the uh, Essex Junction uh, backyard curling club for. Oh yeah, go steal stuff. a couple if you're in the area for sure. All right, Eric. Let's get on to our main topic. I what is it this week? Oh, Alex. This one is. Uh, it might be a little bit of a throwback. We've we've discussed similar uh, things in in pods past, but um, this week we're talking about a Giuseppe Abbiati. Who? Oh, I'm talking about Giuseppe Abbiati. Oh, Giuseppe, my man. Oh, I you know what he's... Giuseppe's doing? Oh, I mean, he's the 18th century uh, Milan Italian engraver, man. Oh, do you have any Giuseppe's in the uh, the Pebble collection, or would those be too rare to be, you know, slaughtered and masked? We don't have any Giuseppe's or Abiatis, I, I would say. Abiatis, um, okay. And, well, it's hard because like 
the thing with uh, the work I'm doing, uh, we don't want any engraves. We want uniform, sort of uh, lame pebbles. Yeah, you want them to fall in line. You don't want them getting any ideas. That's how we prey on our pebbles. Eh? You know, like, we we just are like, you're you're nobody. You're a nothing. You're a, you stupid little gravel. You aren't you aren't special. And then they just put it in our hands, man. I mean that's true. There's nothing worse than a pebble stepping out of line, thinking he's something, and then you gotta you gotta grind him back down again with abrasive material. Yeah. No, we we gaslight our pebbles heavily. Great. Uh, so Giuseppe, what is Giuseppe's uh magnum opus? You know, his his girder and gray, if you will. Um, that's. That's gonna. That, that's a little harder. Uh, a lot of his works were lost to um, the uh, the great Milan orgies of '96. Oh, you see, I thought 1796. Yeah, yeah, I thought it was the ginormous stone dong he carved into the Vatican, which was then covered over in in that other carving. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That that sounds about right. Um. Yeah. Well, he. You know, he he did a lot of smaller things. So, uh, you know, there there's some small prints of uh, battles out there in the world. Um, but I I'm pretty sure that once uh, Milan became such a uh, hotbed of uh, designers, like you know the Gucci's and mm-hmm. the Versace's of the world, um, that they were like stone engravings are so passe, and then they covered them all up with like satins and other other um, you know materials that they found much suited their their preference better that makes sense the big stone shalong in the vatican was i think originally carved over by none other than alex da vinci of all people i i did hear that uh, uh alex da vinci in his famous dome uh, was uh he, he had worked with uh old giuseppe abbiati in the past yeah yeah exactly he knew that giuseppe was you know a maverick who was known to pull a fast one on customers, you know, when they ordered like a big stone pillar, you would add some details to make it less flattering. And mm-hmm. so Alex Da Vinci, actually, he, he carved over it, you know, making it um, from a schlong into just a, a standard pillar, but with still with a six pack on it though. Um, oh, of course. Because, you know, paying homage to the original Rock, Dwayne the Rock Johnson. Uh, mm-hmm. That's true. Or Dwayne the Evil Rock Johnson, also a famous star in his own right. That's that's true. So, Alex, that's yeah. that's all we got for the main topic. Um, Giuseppe and I, we go way back, uh, partied hard back mm-hmm. in the mm-hmm. back in the 90s. But um, now the it's time. Right. Well, of course. Okay. That's, okay, that's the only it. '90s yeah. that I care about. Right. All right. Let's. Uh. Yeah. Let's do some poems, Eric. I don't have uh any topic. You want to just come up with one real quick here? Well, Alex, I I have some terrible news for all of our yeah. listeners out there. Due to uh increased temperatures mm-hmm. within the uh, New Hampshire region, the snow cube is gone. The oh snow gosh, cube no. has been destroyed. Wait, Eric, I just wrote an ode to snow cube. That's wild because I wrote an ode to all cubes. Oh wow, that is. I mean, that's gonna be a brain. blow. There's no snow cube anymore. I mean, that that thing was an institution, a landmark in the Greater Manchester area. Honestly, the only thing that could have made it better is if Giuseppe Abbiati, uh, you know, carved his his famous uh, detailing into it. That's so, right. So Alex, that's right. Uh, I'm gonna go first because yours okay. is a direct nod to the snow cube. Mine, mine's a little more cubey in general. All right. All right. 3D shapes are all the rage. And I'll name a few, so we're on the same page. Prisms and spheres are for your years. Icosahedrons and cones won't leave you alone. Pyramids? Those are just the crypt of Egypt. Cubes are the greatest of them all. Large, medium, or small. Can't go wrong with cubes in any form. Some like them hot, cold, or warm. I can't pick a favorite type of cube, but I will hop aboard the tube. That's right, I'm in London. And geometry, I'm funding. Out here at Oxford, oh, we aren't talking about commas, and you can put that on your mamas. Research into the best type of cube. And here's a hint. While you're waiting, take this breath mint. Your breath is smelly as poo, and the answer is ready for you. It's snow cube. Wow, that was beautiful, Eric. I especially liked your listing of... Uh, three-dimensional shapes like icosahedrons and spheres high mm-hmm. on my list but again mm-hmm. no 
Nothing quite like that cube research coming out of Oxford that I'm glad you participated in. That was. Uh, really no, I didn't participate. I just funded it. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. I'm actually, Throwing I'm actually in London. I'm in London right now, and I'm scared. I'm in a tube. It's, uh, it's like a tunnel, but it's, uh, it's not subway enoughy. I, I'm scared. All right, Eric. Well, I'll, let's see if I can calm your nose, uh, calm your fears, with a poem I like to call Snow Cube. Go for it. Cheese, bullion, ice, and butter. Only one can be the nutter. The one true cube to rule them all starts its life out in the fall with a thin white dusting, oh powder, on a crusting of precipitation in Manchester. The snow cube was born with great pomp and horn to sit in the heat and fester. So heed you the tale and fetch me a pail and we'll build a monument to snow. One so gloriously tall it will outlast them all and never fail to grow. So that's a little... You know, a little ditty about about snow cubes. About the mightiness of the snow cube. Mm-hmm. Exactly. I I actually heard that um the great uh the great New Hampshire cube uh it some say no one knows who built it and it just appeared one day. Some say it was aliens. I think it was Bigfoot. I eh, I don't think it's Bigfoot. I and big if feet. you're Alex, if you're talking about Bigfoot, you better at least use the correct terminology. That my friend is a squatch. Well, is it? I, I thought it was only a squatch if it was in the western part of the United States, and it was a Bigfoot. Well, did I get that backwards? Yeah, uh, sort of. It's. I mean, Bigfoot's sort of like the localized name here. Are, are um, like big but, feet on? Are they like a subfamily of squatch? Like the uh, Yowie? No, no. Well, the Yowie is very, very Australian. Okay. Well, obviously the Yowie diverged when Australia split off from the rest of the continents. Well, of course. So the Yowie's a little different. Um, it has a thing for uh, wearing oversized hats. It's a some call it the Texas Squatch, despite living in Australia, because it it loves cowboy hats and uh, also of calling the ten gallon variety. It loves uh, hanging around the Aboriginal people, and uh, it um actually plays its own instrument called the. Uh, I don't know what it's called. It's a, it's, it's, it's a very guttural word. It's, um, it's, I think it's like, but it's basically just a bunch of snakes tied to a piece of, uh, uh, wood. And then they, they play it like a banjo and they also take that piece of wood and bang it on trees. Cause you know, classic squash calling. Well, I mean, everyone knows call and response. I mean, that that's classic squash behavior that spans all subspecies of squash. Exactly. I mean, big beats of northern california all the way to the yetis of the arctic and himalayas mm -hmm. i mean alex yetis are they're similar to how polar bears are uh, yeah, their they're the largest and most carnivorous of all the uh, oh definitely animals. very very fearsome and uh, yeah. quite easily aggravated um whereas i believe that the bigfoot is much similar to the uh, black bear of uh you know the northeast of the u.s where it um Sort of, it, it's it's a little timid. It likes to hang out in uh, out of focus areas, and of course, the Pacific Northwest squatches are uh, akin to grizzlies, which of course makes sense. It's it's just the way that they the way that they're raised. You know, squatches survive, and it's it's how they're it's the environment. You know, it's it's that basic nurture nature sort of thing. Exactly. You know what they say, Eric? Big feet. You gotta run for eat, but if it's a Sasquatch, you have to look at your watch. And if it's a Yeti, oh, forgetty, you're already dead. Oh, you're already deady if you see a Yeti. If you see a Yeti. So, that's I mean, true. that's the children's, you know, mnemonic that everyone knows. Although, Alex, do you know what's something I've... I wonder if, uh, if the Yowie is very similar to the Koala Bear in that regard. I think it's a lot more fearsome than the Koala Bear. Um, um, it's okay. It's more like a drop bear. Yeah. Oh, oh my. Oh my goodness, Eric. Mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The more you yep, say their name, sense. the more power they have. Yeah. Watch out for drop bears. Um, and then also, of course, uh, the Chinese squatches are uh, lumbering oafs, uh, just like the panda bears. Uh, you don't see them very often because mm -hmm. they're a uh, very low sex drive. Um, and terrible diet. Uh, actually causes them to not not make make a lot of offspring. Yeah, and again, all Sasquatch species live in out-of-focus areas of your camera, primarily, um, with some of them in places you might see other animals' washed-out footprints or mm -hmm. 
or uh, particularly human shaped sticks. Oh, that's one hundred percent. Um, yeah, that's all I have. All right. Well, you want to um, ask answer some questions from our our, our valuable listeners? Yes, we could. All right. All right. This one comes in from the podcast, Eric. I think we we might have a new contributor here. He says. Hello, Dewey boys. I'm also trying to smell what's for dinner, but I'm cooking vegetarian. So what sort of smell should my smelling salts, a.k.a. the rocks, be smelling? A concerned guru, Mac. So looks like Mac the guru tuned in this week for us, Eric. Oh, Definitely Mac not someone I made up. All right. So Mac the guru is smelling. No, oh, he's, um, he's, he, he's smelling them mushrooms and the other vegetables. All right. But he's a vegetarian. Yeah. So. The lack of meats. I mean, the the supply of meats in our last episode. I'm surprised that didn't scare him away. I I know. I know. There was way too much juicy, dripping tenderness coming out of that last episode. Hmm. All right. Well, that's uh, it that definitely piques my interest personally. What should his smelling salt smell? Yeah. What you know? What should he be smelling? You know. For um. Dinner? Let's see. So. You and I, as uh, normal people, we would be smelling the succulent uh, taste of fat frying and yeah. uh, mainly lard, you know, the animal fat. Um, I know I make sure not to trim off any of my uh, fresh scraps. I like to cook with the bone in, uh, sometimes the the fur on it, too. So I, I eh, he should be smelling the same thing. But just because you're vegetarian doesn't mean that you should uh, not be at least cooking uh your your hunted captures well I, I think eric that just because you're vegetarian doesn't mean you need to clean out your cast iron frying pan which is why whoa 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 you would never do that i know which is why what the rocks should be smelling is a lovely patina of butter and and mushrooms and other umami flavors like uh meat though you know and just just uh like, Ooh. Oh man! Oh yeah! Just just that that delicious Maillard reaction that creates the smells. Well, you know what they say about miso, Alex. What do they say about miso, Eric? Miso hungry and miso tasty. Exactly. So you know that's probably what he should be smelling. Eric, I have another question here. Actually, this one comes from uh, a source near and dear to our hearts. It says, "Hey, Dewey Bros, this mm-hmm. is uh, Earl Er mm-hmm. Ruler." from the Finnish cross-country ski team. As you may have heard, it was cold at the Olympics this year. I froze my little Sven. With your worldly knowledge, I was hoping you could find a company that manufactures heat socks for my little Sven. Please let me know. I am in the hot tub trying to make Sven happy again and would like to go out skiing. Oh, gosh. I um... So, what can Earl Uller do about his frozen Sven? Well... I've uh, I've heard some terrible things about freezing your Sven. Mm-hmm. Um, I I heard that you really should uh, keep it warm, keep it toasty, yeah. And um, whatever you do, do not get it too hot too quick. That's true. You, if 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 your Sven gets too cold, you have to gently warm your Sven up. You oh, cannot... gently. Also, do not do not rub your Sven too much. Okay. Right. That would be bad. That can cause blisters and uh, destroy the skin. What you got to do is stay away from the boiling water. I know it's tempting. Like, you see that nice hot boiling water, and you you might think, oh, Sven, I bet you'd love that right now because you're cold. No, 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 don't do that. What you got to do is uh, warm up warm up some butter, all right? This is, a, this is an old uh, Arctic Explorer trick. That's why they always bring uh, sticks of butter with them. It's not actually for consumption. It's for their Svens. So you uh you carve you carve a nice uh you make a nice little butter mold and then um wrap the wrap the Sven in uh in the butter mold and of course your your little Sven is gonna be thinking wow what is what is this this is all buttery and um the heat the butter actually draws the heat out of the Sven and replaces it with a nice oily delicious butter uh scent and texture. Um, that's how you treat, uh, Sven bite if, if you happen to get it. But in order to avoid Sven bite in the first place, oh, I, oh, yeah. I actually have found a product that works even in very cold Olympic, uh, ski racing events or, you know, any time normally in Finland. 
and that is Mrs. Penny's Pecker Protector. And Ooh. Mrs. Penny's Pecker Protector is a merino wool um, insulating tube for you to keep your little spend warm on even the chilliest of days. They're uh, actually you know, made in... I was going to say, where is uh, where is where where are they located? Uh, Miss Penny's Penny pr- uh, Pecker Protectors? Yeah, where are the Pecker Protectors made from? Uh, they're actually a Vermont company. Um, oh. And they are in combination. They She gets her material from the same suppliers that supply Darn Tough, which is why they have a lifetime guarantee. That's... No matter how crusty. Mm, that's pretty good. Yeah. I, uh, I also heard that... Um... The, the secret key to staying warm is uh, in, of course, uh, the, the pecker protector is actually the um, full circle. But uh, it's the squat fur. I mean, the Bigfoot, oh. the Bigfoot fur. Well, you can get any number of Bigfoots, any number of squatches fur. But Bigfoot is the most is the most soft and supple. Well, uh, I mean, very fitting to the Northeast region where we we love our exactly. soft, supple fur. And furs. where if you are uh, perhaps mounting a, a mountaineering expedition up one of our lovely mountains, it can get very chilly, mm-hmm. especially for the Sven. All right, Eric, I think we got to thank our sponsors and wrap up this episode. Well, I'm going to thank. Um, I don't know. I, I don't want to thank anyone this week, Alex. I I'm just all thanked out because I have been busy being sponsored by Thanksosaurus Rexes, the brand new thank you cards for every occasion. Hallmark is a thing of the past. With these brand new thank you postcards, you can send them to all your friends with coming in fun designs, normally uh, dinosaur themed. Thanksosaurus Rexes. Um, this podcast is brought to you this week by Stones of All Sizes. Remember, no matter what shape or size stone you are, Eric will grind you to dust with an abrasive water slurry uh we couldn't have done it without homegrown hops they're uh they're home and they're grown and that beer will be made we don't know i I mean after last week's uh special session who knows what's uh coming up in the works got to keep you on your toes this podcast is brought to you by miss penny's pecker protectors now with real yeti fur from darn tough uh, not Yeti, Big Feats. That also reminds me, Eric. Remember the saying, you're already deady if you see a Yeti. That is true. Um, And then, of course, we couldn't have done it without the World Wildlife Foundation protecting all bears and all Yeti, uh, all Sasquatches across the, uh, across the world. Uh, and finally, this podcast has had generous financial support this week from Big Rose. Big Rose, new and improved Squatch Finder. All you got to do is chug the whole bag, and you too will be seeing Squatches. <laughs> Big Rose's Squatch Finder, uh, Rose. We couldn't have done it without Snow Cube. Come and see. Oh, oh, you. It's it's gone. Oh yeah, we could have done it without them. Global All right. global warming has destroyed our sponsor. This has been Just Do It season ten episode episode six. No episode episode oh, eleven episode eleven season six of Just Do It a Dewey Brothers podcast. We got it right at the end. I'm Alex. Um, I'm I'm the other one. And for the love of God, man, just send it. Snow cube it. Snow cube it. Oh wait, Snow never, cube never it. mind. Oh oh it's oh it's it melted. Poor snow cube.